Hey, everybody, it's Tony Caldwell. Welcome to another uh, edition of Uncapped Agent, where we're talking about the future of insurance distribution. It is middle of 2021, and I've got a great guest with me this afternoon, Nicholas Ayers from Mesa, Arizona. Uh, Nicholas is a serial entrepreneur, insurance agent, and currently uh, has a business that's helping lots of agencies with their automation, uh, their AMS, but especially marketing. And I want to uh, dig into his brain just a little bit this afternoon on technology, insure tech, and those kinds of things. And where are we going to go in the next few years with marketing? How are agents going to build successful agencies of the next five and 10 years? So, uh, Nicholas, welcome. Hey, Tony, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. You bet. I'm glad you're with me today. And again, uh, we've had to delay this for a couple of weeks because, as I was saying just before we got on here, you know, we all quit wearing our masks. Uh, because COVID's over, but colds aren't. And so I had I had a vicious cold. Anyway, I appreciate you uh, hanging in there and coming back. So um, here's the first question I've got for you, and that is uh, you're on your third or fourth company. So um, that qualifies as a serial entrepreneur. Have you always, your whole life, kind of you know had lemonade stands and stuff like that? Is this, uh, or is this something everybody in your family does, or how did this happen? No, I think if I got the bug from anybody, it would definitely be my mother. But um, no, honestly, it started, I started my first company in 2000, uh, after I got fired in 2011 from a sales producer job. I was a, I was a producing agent in a, in a captive company. And I was the number one agent in the territory, large captive company. If I said their name, many people would know who they are. And uh, broken into territories in Northern California, Nevada, and Utah. And I was the top agent. Uh, 2011, this is kind of the advert of digital marketing and some of, you know, what we kind of think of digital marketing today I was doing a lot of those things. Company didn't really care for it, uh, because they couldn't control it. Uh, I was in my mid twenties. So I was really dumb and they had said, Hey, you need to take this stuff down. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's silly. And, uh, I'm your, I'm your best agent. What are you going to do? Fire me. And I learned really quick that in corporate America, yeah, they, they will fire you. Uh, and I remember driving home that day and I said, you know, I, I will never and for the, for the rest of my life ever work for somebody ever again. And so that's when I, I launched my first scratch agency. Uh, and that's great. Yeah. And so I think just from there, it just, you know, I, I, I would make a horrible employee. I recognize that I'm not a good employee, uh, but uh, I can, I can seemingly do other things. And so that's just kind of where that came into play. You know, I love that story because it seems uh, to hit really close to my I had a, a fellow who was the president of the company I worked for, and uh, he was an accountant. And you should never put an accountant at the head of anything, right? And uh, same thing happened to me. He got fired on a Friday, uh, self-employed after that. Best thing anyone ever did for me. They did me a favor. I'm unemployable. So, um, you know, and he was just making that obvious comment on Friday afternoon at 3.30. But uh, anyway, welcome to the uh, to the entrepreneur ranks. I mean, you've been doing it for a really long time. And your current, uh, and you've been an insurance agent. One of the things I was intrigued with is you believe in giving back. Um, and that also resonated with me because uh, I think that if you cast your bread on the water, it does come back to you. So you actually helped start an organization that works with a lot of agencies around the country. Tell me just a little bit about that. Yeah. So in 2013, uh, co-started with a, with a partner, uh, insurance agency owners Alliance, IAOA. It's an advocacy group. Um, it's a group that we, uh, it's only membership, uh, is that you are an independent insurance agency owner. And the whole goal of that is, you know, it's really built on three pillars, selflessness, innovation, and collaboration. Everything that we want to do, we want to selflessly share. We want to innovate with our peers. We want to collaborate together to create the best agencies that we possibly can. If I go through uh, existence and I believe that, and and I, and I operate from this level of the scarcity mindset that says that if you're winning, I must be losing. Then really that's not any setup. That's not really any recipe for success, but when we share together and we collaborate together and it doesn't matter if you're, uh, three states away, three blocks away, three miles away, or three doors away. There's plenty of business out there for every independent agent uh, out there. And so, you know, we want to share best practices. We want to share um, operations. We want to share marketing. We want to share tactics. We want to share strategy. We want to help improve the channel uh, because we believe that we're better together. And when we come together as a channel, 
uh, we can really, you know, do a lot of good things, both in our communities, in our industries, uh, in our own personal lives and for our families. And so uh, it's a group that started in 2013. We hold a, a conference every year. Uh, this year it's in November. Uh, we'll have over a thousand agency owners in attendance. Uh, and, you know, it's really been life-changing in the sense that I've made some of my very best friends out of that group. Um, we've, you know, our families have gotten to know each other. We've done life together. And it's more than just, you know, figuring out what the coverage A dwelling is on a home and, right. you know, all that. It's, it's really building relationship and community. And that's, that's the value. That's the value of it. So you've heard of something that the uh, Independent Agency uh, of America, Brokers of America have called the young agents, right? That's yeah. a whole, and, and I, I uh, was never a part of that, but I have a lot of friends that were, it sounds a little similar to that in some respects, although it wasn't limited to agency owners, but um, how are you different than other industry organizations, would you say? Yeah, I think they all have a place, to be honest with you. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I tell people is IAOA is not going to get involved in litigation or in legislation or any of those things. And the associations do a really great job at that. And they should. Uh, we'll support their efforts. We'll back them. We'll, we'll, we'll be a cheerleader where we can. We'll be a supporter where we can. But that's just not our game. Our game is day-to-day -day agency operations uh, from a peer level. And it's agency owners helping agency owners. Okay. There's over 7,500 of us now and, you know, spread out from everywhere from Hawaii to Maine to Florida to Washington state and everywhere in between. And so it's just, it's all, about, it's, it's, it's different in that it's, it's, it's peer to peer advocacy and support and working together. Uh, you know, there are things that we've done in each other's communities. that has been really cool. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, you know, uh, I remember 2016, I think it was 2016 hurricane Harvey hit Texas, uh, devastated a lot of, um, a lot of the state. And in the Houston area, we went down there with a, with a group of agents. Uh, we helped in the cleanup efforts. We helped in the get back efforts. We've done that in California with brush fires. We've done that in Florida with hurricanes. Uh, we've done that, you know, everywhere where we can. Uh, we're doing, I think we're putting together something for, you know, the recent thing that happened in Miami, where we can help, you know, brother to brother, sister to sister, we can help each other out. Uh, that's what we want to do. It goes beyond just, hey, this is, this is the script I'm using in my sales calls. It's, it's, it's that, and it's a yeah. lot more. And so I think the, the associations, they do a really good job of what they're do at what they do and what they, their, their, their place. And I just think that, you know, same as any, with any, any agency owner around the corner, you know, it's, it's not a us versus them. It's how do we come together and how do we improve the independent agency channel? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think we're a business that attracts outgoing, gregarious, community-minded human beings. And so it makes sense to have as many outlets like that as you can. So yeah. tell our uh, listeners and watchers how to reach you. I mean, what's the website address where they can go to find the organization? For uh, IAOA, you would just go to www.iaoa.com. Uh, you'll find the engagement and the interaction uh, in our Facebook group. If you just search out Insurance Agency Owners Alliance, uh, you can request to join that. That is, again, it's only for agency owners and you have to own an independent agency. Um, and that's how we try to keep it as pure as we possibly can. Um, there's no pitching, there's no selling. The only thing we tell people to do is just come to an event so we can all hang out in person. Um, and that's all we, that's all we, want to do. And so it's all about relationship and community. So that's where you'd find us on Facebook uh, and then also on our website. Okay, great. Well, I'm, uh, uh, hopefully um, there'll be some folks be interested in the organization as a consequence of the call today. But um, let's shift back more to the topic about insurance distribution. So that's just a fancy word for how we're going to sell insurance in the future. And you've obviously, you've started from scratch and built a couple of agencies. You've pivoted to the insure tech space. Mm -hmm. um, tell me just a, a minute about better. Yeah. So Better Agency is, it started out as an idea to help agents do some of the things that they don't do very well, frankly, uh, by the law of large numbers. And that is to think, you know, like a marketer, to involve technology that's simple, frictionless into their agency. I'll give you a classic example. This is something that we see, if we've seen for years with agents, they'll say, um, what type of campaigns are you running? What are you putting in those emails? When do you send out text messages? What are the triggers? Very tactical stuff. So better agency sought to kind of solve some of those things so that an insurance agent didn't have to think about them. So it started out as a fully automated CRM with campaigns for sales and service and renewals and, and, and claims. So you put information in there 
and you can automate all of your communication and tasks. You don't have to think about what to send. It's all done for you. It's all built for you. Uh, we sought to do what a lot of companies in the software space do, and that's to integrate. It's weird when you get outside of insurance, a lot of these companies have no problem <laughs> integrating with each other. It's kind yeah. of a normal thing. But in insurance, uh, that's not always the case. You're dealing with a lot of legacy providers and software providers that, and if you're an insurance agent, you know this, you go to your AMS and you're like, hey, can you integrate with so-and-so? They'll say, no, we don't want to. Um, we had a dream of trying to be kind of being that integrator and really providing value with real integrations um, without getting too nerdy. Uh, just because something integrates with another doesn't mean that integration is very good. Uh, mm -hmm. But we wanted to be able to make it as seamless as possible so that an insurance agent only had to really be in one system as much as possible. We found out really quickly that uh, this, there was software providers in, in the insur insurance world that said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and there were some that did that and we just found, wow, this is not very good. This doesn't help solve the problems that we're trying to solve. And so we quickly said, well, why don't we just go get the data that, that some of these AMSs are getting? Why don't we just create a connection to Ivan's? Found out in the last uh, 11 or so, 12 years, there's only been two companies that have actually been able to successfully do it. Uh, we are one of them. And it, it, it's, a, it's, it's the development work that goes into it. It's the, it's the thinking about the processes. So we kind of said, well, we're going to add the AMS component to the CRM. We're going to be the first really kind of hybrid, what we call a sales-driven AMS, an AMS that actually does something with your data, takes the data and it does stuff with it automatically. So you don't have to think about it or do it. Um, and that's where that came into play. Now it's kind of taken on a life of its own. There's over a hundred built-in campaigns. There's multiple pipelines. Still trying to stay true to that spirit of making it frictionless and simple because we realized insurance agents didn't, you know, a lot of them didn't go to college to become a computer science expert. They don't have a, a degree in programming and engineering. You know, they're insurance agents and we want to, we want to help our customers. We want to build stronger uh, books. We want to build stronger agencies, have employees and clients that love us build stronger communities. And we need technology that's going to come alongside of us and help us do that. And so a better agency takes the whole approach of automating that entire customer life cycle as much as possible. And we're still adding, there's still, there's still iterations and there's still things that are on the horizon that we're trying to accomplish. And, you know, really proud of, of what we're doing and the agencies that we're, that we're helping today. You know, I'm intrigued. I mean, you're a young person, relatively speaking. I mean, uh, at least compared to me and a uh, big future in front of you. And here you are building software, not to replace agents, which is what um, a lot of people are trying yeah. to do in one way or another, but to enhance them. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm intrigued with that. Yeah, uh, we, uh, you know, we call it, and we didn't coin the phrase, so I can't take full credit for it, but we tell people there's, there's the traditional stereotypical insure tech where it's right. kind of carriers and, and big private equity firms come in and better agencies up in this point has been bootstrapped and self-funded, you know, and it's, it's, it's broker tech is what we're trying to champion. We're trying to champion broker technology. That's going to, we can put in the hands of agents and brokers and say, go build the agency of your dreams, you know, go, go and not even that, but use the technology that's, you know, simple and simplified so that you can, create more seamless workflows between you customers and employees and you as the agency owner, you don't have to feel chained to your desk seven days a week, you know, thinking about how you're going to get your next customer, you know, so it's broker technology that we're really trying to champion. You know, so somebody who's really involved um, in the industry with other agency owners uh, and by the way, are you still operating your own agency? I can't remember the call whether you sold that one or are you still Yeah, have so that? I actually, I actually, and I haven't really made it too public, but I actually sold my my agency effective January 1st of 2021 so that I can go all in with better. It got to that point where it was hard to serve two masters. Gotcha. And so, yeah, I, I did sell my agency on, seven, on, on January 1. Okay. All right. But nevertheless, you've still been an agency owner uh, multiple times now and you're, you're building this new company. Um, and obviously, in both of those roles as a, as a visionary uh, entrepreneur yourself, uh, you've had to think a lot about the direction the business is going to go in. You know, a lot of people are scared that a big chunk of the market, especially at the low end, personal insurance, uh, you know, and small commercial, are relentlessly either moving online, moving to uh, alternative forms of insurance, automated insurance, that sort of thing and maybe away from the agent. I'm one of those who believes there is going to be a role for agents uh, that'll be different, uh, but that, that we're not going to go away from the picture. Um, but there are those who are worried that that's going to happen. You're obviously not worried about that. 
No, I'm not worried about it. Like you, I think there's going to be a, a change, uh, uh, an evolution of the independent agency channel. I do think, you know, when I, when I first started in the business, I started as a selling producer in 2005. And at that time, uh, a lot of agents were still advertising in the yellow pages. And that was actually still a thing. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's changed. And now we are becoming more online. And we're becoming more digital. Um, what, what I will say is I do think it will be more turbulent waters for those agents who are not uh, fully invested in their agency and those agents that maybe only rely on a certain uh, line of business. Uh, so if they're, if they're very strong just in uh, auto insurance or home insurance, perhaps, I, I can see more challenging sides on the personal line side. Um, I think the, the well-rounded agencies that are looking more at, at their operations as risk advisors and risk managers, um, I think are going to have a strong place. And I do think that uh, the agents, I do think agents are going to stick around for, listen, if travel agents can stick around forever, then I, there's no, then I believe that uh, insurance agents will also stick around in, in greater, in greater force. I do think there's going to be a lot more opportunity on the, on the commercial line side. So if you're a personal lines agent, I would strongly recommend starting to learn commercial or starting to learn other things uh, that you can use to, um, you know, enhance your value proposition to your marketplace. Um, I, 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 I see, I see, you know, the data tells us everything that there is to know from a carrier side. The, the data says very clearly that business that is written with an agent and has a field underwriter as an agent performs a lot better, retains, has lower loss ratios, is more profitable. Carriers know this. Um, and I think that there's always going to be a play from the distribution side for agents. But I do think you need to kind of evolve your, your skill set a little bit and diversify your value proposition. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, uh, there's a gentleman who does a lot of analysis of insurance carriers and their results. Uh, his name is Chris Moran. He's been on my podcast before. Are you familiar yeah. with Chris? Yeah. So Chris wrote an article. It's been about two years ago now in um, – in the insurance journal where he actually made the counterpoint, which is that uh, carriers that have, um, that are selling direct in personal insurance have better loss ratios, better operating results and lower costs um, than those selling to agents. And that this was actually creating a, a conundrum for um, traditional ag uh, agency um, distributed uh, carriers who, who are looking at those numbers and asking themselves, why are we paying more money to insurance agents to get lesser results from a, from a loss perspective. In other words, the field underwriting piece wasn't really working out for them. The flip side would be that agents would say, well, but you know, you've increasingly taken away our ability to influence those numbers because your uh, pricing and customer selection criteria are all algorithm driven. So it's interesting. I mean, um, I don't know that the data does support your contention. I don't know that it doesn't, but I think there's a big, there's a big, <laughs> problem in C-suites trying to figure it out. Every, every report I've seen direct from a carrier um, is, speaks, to, speaks to my point that the, the, the policies that are written with an independent agent tend to perform much, much better than, a, than policies that go direct. You can look at, you can look at the, the case studies that you see now with current insurance, insure tech providers, um, you know, the ones that have fruit as their, as their name. Um, their, their profitability does not stand very well. Their loss ratios are through the roof and their profitability isn't very good. Yeah. Every public report shows that to be the case. Now, will those things get, will, will over time, will that be improved upon? I'm sure it will be. But I think that what technology, what agents are doing now is they are using technology to almost regain a competitive advantage right now with the amount of private equity money that's in the software world and that is, that is funding these, these, these companies, it oftentimes feels like David versus Goliath and all you got is five smooth stones in your hand. Um, but sometimes five, five smooth stones is all you need. And I think that the agents that are embracing technology and the agents that are uh, increasing their value proposition, becoming less transactional, more relational and using technology to do so will still be around. I think, again, they'll need to diversify what they're doing. Uh, and if they're just self-reliant on just one line of business or one, one vertical, personal lines versus commercial lines or whatever, I think those agents will have to face a tougher 
challenge. Of course, there's all kinds of variables in place between geography, um, brand position in the marketplace, where they're at. I think there's all kinds of variables that, that will speak to those particular success points. Um, but I think the independent agent is here to stay. I think you're going to see the pendulum. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pendulum that swings back and forth. And I think that I, if I'm an independent agent, I think that we're, we're doing all right. Not that we don't have things we need to get better at, but I certainly think that uh, I don't, I don't fear the meteor is going to take us out anytime soon. Well, you know what? I don't either. And so we're in agreement on that, but I think um, you said something just now, I think it's really interesting. And you talked about moving away from being transaction oriented. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that I've talked and written a lot about, uh, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, because I think it's been almost the death of many agencies, you know, to me, there was two things that happened um, and about 15 years ago, both. Um, so really around the time that you were um, uh, entering into the selling process, I guess, but, you know, one was the multi-company rating system. And the other one um, was that uh, you had carriers really beginning to use their own algorithms to select and price business. And they had a lot of issues with that, especially in the early days. Um, but you brought in a whole generation of agents into the, particularly personal insurance, who focused on price, not on solving problems, answering objections, and other things like that. And, and so what I, the way I characterize that is that they were using technology to foster transactions. You just said using technology to foster relationships, and I think that's actually where the future is. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit more about your thinking on that. How do agents best use technology to, to multiply as well as foster relationships? I mean, obviously CRM is a piece of this, but I mean, how do you do it? Yeah. So I think there is, a, it's a lot more than just showing up for customers when it's time for a renewal or it's time to ask for a referral or even a Google review. I think you can automate certain portions. Now there, there's, and I'm a big fan of automation. We created an automation platform. There's a lot of things you shouldn't automate, but there's a lot of things that you can use automation to really enhance that customer relationship in a way that feels very re real and, and tangible and um, kind of speaks to the customer where they're at in the, in the customer journey and their customer life cycle with your agency. And so I think utilizing technology to create automated touch points throughout the year that are value-based. They're not necessarily solicitations of any sort, but they're, they're really value-based. And, and by that, I mean, it could be, uh, and if you're doing the work as an agent, this, this is where I'm speaking at, but you're, you're maybe uh, creating that, a value piece that's going to speak to, uh, you know, people in Sandusky, Ohio, and that's where your agency's at. And, you know, things that they need to know around their community or around there. And you're becoming kind of that central figure, that authoritative piece in your, in your community. I think that's where technology can really help you out. It can help you scale. You got an agency of 5,000 clients. You're not talking to all of them which means you're probably not retaining all of them. In a very commoditized insurance world where they're bombarded, bombarded with solicitations every five minutes from other carriers or on the radio or on the internet or wherever the case is, you know, you've got you've to position yourself much, more, much differently. And so I think utilizing those automated touch points to build relationships, whether it's with content or whether it's, you know, utilizing life events or things that, uh, you know, endear you to your customer at scale is where the benefit is. Like I mentioned, if you have 5,000 clients, you know, I think every agent would say, I'd love to be able to talk to all of them. I'd love to be able to communicate with all of them prior to the renewal and see if there's anything that they need or making sure there's any gaps, but that's really impossible. And even if you could do it, you couldn't do it with margin. You couldn't do it with any margins because you'd have to hire uh, you know, so many people, it, it become unprofitable for you from a business standpoint. And so technology allows you to maintain those margins while still creating those touch points and automating workflows and communications so that you can build relationships with your customers. Now, I don't know whether you've uh, done any work in this area or been thinking about it or not, um, but I am curious, you know, one of the things that people love to do is do it for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a little surprising. I remember, um, you know, when, when self-service gas stations became, you know, all the rage and you quit getting your gas. I mean, there were a lot of people didn't like that until they tried it once or twice. And then, you know, and I know, uh, I remember 10, 15 years ago, driving up to a gas pump that didn't have the credit card machine working. You know, it's like, I have to go inside. You have you're, to go, no, you have to go into that death hut and you're not sure if you're going to die in there. Yeah. yeah I'm not going to do that. You know, I want to, I want to take care of myself. And so we're one of the last industries in the face of the earth to actually let people serve themselves. 
And, you know, one of the things that technology really hasn't cracked in my view yet is giving agents tools to let um, clients serve themselves effectively. Do you see that coming in the next year? Yeah, Yeah, I I actually see it now, honestly. I think that uh, there's a couple different uh, players in the in the in the in the space that are actually doing this now, and I think that they're only going their enhancements are only going to get uh, better. And so, from a self service standpoint, being able to give your customer something from your agency that allows them to, um, you know, I guess effectively service their policy in a way that is, you know, correct, or uh, it's underwritten properly. Uh, that That is actually technology that there are people solving for and problems that people are solving for right now and vendors that are in the space doing that, and they're doing it pretty well. Um, and so I, I definitely agree with you that it's one of those those things that, and now of course there's all, there's, there's reasons why, but it's interesting. I can go on to, uh, I can look at my retirement accounts right now and I can make changes in my, in my portfolio. I can make changes and, 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 and nobody says anything, right? but I can't do it on my insurance because of an underwriting issue or because of this out of the other. So I agree with you. It is somewhat odd. Um, luckily there are, and, and, and a lot of it, if, if we're being very frank here, um, it's not because the technology doesn't exist. It's because there are, it's a two, it takes two to tango. And there have to be there has to be carrier access. There has to be an allowance for that, for that, so that technology can plug into that and right. make it happen. Right. And so, I jokingly say, you know, from the company that I got fired from, I said, you know, it started in 1908, and I think the same people are still in charge. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it takes a, a changing of the mind. And and I don't know, I can't, I can't pretend to know all the reasons why, um, whether it's data security or this out of the other. Or I I can't pretend to know those answers, but. Uh, when carriers start to see that, and I do think carriers are coming around to things, you know, three years ago, if you asked a carrier for their API, good luck, good luck. Mm -hmm. Most people at a a carrier probably didn't even know what API stood for. And, you know, you couldn't do anything. Now carriers are starting to come around and, and and it might be a little slower than we want. It takes a long time to to steer a big ship. Um, But I do see that happening now and I see it actually getting better. Well, you know, I hope it does. Um, obviously, we're a highly regulated, heavily regulated industry, and there's a whole lot of issues surrounding that. But that hasn't stopped the securities business, banking, right. and other heavily regulated financial uh, organized uh, or financial. I can uh, go industry. on. I, I bank with Chase. Chase yeah. is my. So if we're going to name, I bank with Chase. Um, yeah. I can go on to Chase.com right now. I can log in and I can start a new account. I mean, right. that is what I mean. Well, I can, to your, I can open actually, a new account. Yeah, actually, better to your point. And, and by the way, you know, I'm I'm involved in banking uh, as the chairman of a of a small community bank. Small community banks can do the same thing. And in the face of the Patriot Act, which is the most burdensome set of regulations, you can't believe how, uh, from the back end from a bank, how hard it is for uh, the, the regulatory scrutiny and oversight banks enjoy as a consequence of the Patriot Act. Well intentioned, well meaning, but the point is. Uh, you know, opening an account is actually a gigantic pain in the ass for a financial institution, and they've automated it. And you can do it in five minutes online. So why can't you do an insurance policy? Why can't I? Why can't I add a car? Yep. I, yeah. You know, and say, hey, you know, you give me recommendations on based on what what you know about my risk, and say, well, hey, you're taking this car off. This, this car had full coverage. Do you want full? You know, you can do that. That's that's right. not. We're not Elon Musk here trying to get to Mars. Um, that can be done. Right. And so, you know, technology, technology is there. People ask all the time, Nick, can you guys connect to this? And I'll say, yes, absolutely. We could. Yeah. Do they, do they well, want to? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, I have a, a, a strong uh, feeling or, or sense that we will be able to do that in five years. I don't know how you think about uh, it. You, you can do it. There, there are, like I said, there are. Well, we can do it now. now. I'm saying it will become commonplace in five years. Oh, for sure. For yeah, sure. In five, Much more. In, Much in more. five years. Which is interesting then because, okay, so if you're a carrier and you're not already working on that, you know, if you agree with us, you better get busy. Uh, the flip side is if you're an agent and you're not prepared for that, either with the, the software that you've got now, you need to be paying attention to it because it, it ain't going to be five years. It's going to be a few years. You know, it, I, might be, I, it, might, it might be five months. Yeah, I mean, well, you don't know. Not likely from, uh, from what I see, but it's coming and it's coming pretty quickly. It's just, 
you know, carriers have a much bigger problem, I think, in a sense than agents do from a technology perspective. I, I talked to a, a, a senior executive um, with a regional carrier in the Northeast who's, they're killing it with, um, you know, they're, they're issuing homeowners policies with almost no questions, you know, and they're issuing them and their loss ratios are outstanding. It's just, you know, it takes 30 seconds to do a policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, and the, they're doing it with agents also. Uh, and the agents are also killing it and making great, uh, yeah. you know, great commissions and also great profit sharing checks. And so everybody else that's not doing that is five years behind. Yeah, for um, sure. For sure. It, it's going to be a mate and you'll see the gap, uh, widen even more in that time the, in the carriers and the agents. And it, it's, it's from the top down mm-hmm. from the carriers to the agents, uh, those who didn't prepare themselves properly are going to, are I think, are in for a rough haul. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to paint a utopian picture. I think that independent agents are are immune from anything or that, you know, where you have this superpower, you have to still protect your business. You still have to think like any business owner in any industry would do. And how do you, how do you take those next steps? How do you evolve? How do you stay relevant? How do you engage your marketplace? And I think that you have to adapt to what the marketplace wants and needs and what they're doing. If they're already used to doing these things everywhere else, if I can go on Amazon and I can go anywhere and I can do all these things, if I can go on chase.com, like that, those carriers and those people that do that are going to have a competitive advantage from a positioning standpoint and I think that they're going to get uh, much further along than those that, that didn't in, your, in years to come. And, and you're going to see, I think, a lot of, and we're already seeing it, right? Consolidation. Uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of movement in that area. I think that it, you're going to start to see even more of it in the years to come because people just, you know, the hurricane's coming and they didn't, they, they got to get out of Dodge. So as a technologist, let's switch gears just for a second and talk about the next uh, 12 to 24 months with, with, uh, with the hindsight and wisdom and lessons learned from COVID. So, uh, you know, we're at least seeming to come out of COVID now. Uh, things are sort of back to normal. Even in California, they are, you know, more or less back to normal. And I think they're probably the last state to come on. Come on. Um, but, you know, COVID was this amazing learning laboratory. Uh, and we learned a lot, I think, uh, I don't care where you were sitting in the industry, you learned a bunch unless sure. you, you know, just checked out for 18 months. What do you think are the top two or three things COVID has taught us that agents ought to use to power their businesses over the next 18 to 36 months? I definitely think it's requiring the right tech stack. Okay. And, and I can say this and anything I say at this point is, you know, take it as a grain of salt. So I'm going to try to remove myself out of it. Um, but I think, really knowing what your tech stack is there go back to march and april of 2020 and there were offices were closing up sending their workers home and people started to realize my voip system i can't even or my phone system i can't even use my phones right i can't i can't use my ams i don't i, I it's locally installed i can't even access it from a browser right. um those things realize it still exists by the way i mean i didn't realize you could people still have servers yes in their oh, yes. Yeah, well, I know yeah. some still have typewriters, but um, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, but even you, you know, the technology, you know, it, it, it some of it was locally installed, mm-hmm. uh, meaning they couldn't just access it from anywhere, right? I think so. Re- realizing that you need 21st century technology, I, I joke and I say some of these programs were created back when the OJ Simpson trial was on, and I don't think they've ever changed them, yeah. Um, and I think that became very evident to people. And people were quickly adapting. I think the other thing too, from just a business standpoint is, and, and you know, we're not uncovering it or slaying any dragons here or uncovering any massive secrets, but the understanding that it's okay to have employees that don't work in the office. I think that was a big revelation for people. Uh, agencies that I talked to today, most of them were like, we could get in the office, but my team really enjoys not being in the office. Right. And we're, we do better with that. Or we have a hybrid system now, wherever. So I think that realization um, was also there. And I think it was, um, it was, it was, it was, it's like Paul Revere writing through telling people that the British are coming. Like, you know, we're not immune to these other things and other things are going to come, come to us. And we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to, you know, hunker down and see and, and deal with them. And I think that having, having the right partners and having the right reliance, you know, and there were a lot of people that they realized that, all the rigs in one basket from a niche standpoint was, was really problem. You've heard the term you know, there are riches in the niches. And I believe that I, I do think that it's better to be a specialist than a generalist in your business and in your agency. 
there were a lot of people that really suffered because maybe their niche was hospitality right. or, or other things that they were greatly affected by COVID. Yeah. And so kind of understanding, Hey, I, I need to kind of maybe uh, add to my, my, my repertoire here and have a little bit more, I think was another valuable lesson from a business standpoint that people had. Okay. Yeah. You know, I look at this in really three buckets, capital management and geography. Um, and so, you know, the first one's less obvious, I think, to agency owners, but because we're a low capitalization business, not, uh, you know, not like uh, some industries, but, uh, and luckily agencies, right, their, their income flows continued, right? People kept buying insurance, the whole economy didn't crater and so their, their uh, cash flow didn't stop. But um, you have to have capital to make it, to make it through uh, emergencies and transitional yeah. kinds of things. And yeah. one of the things that I see a lot is, especially in smaller agencies, is they don't have any capital. They don't have any working capital. And yeah. so a lesson there is, hey, set some money aside for a rainy day because there may not be PPP loans next time, right? So, right. yeah, so that, that's a lesson that I, I, I want to make sure everybody takes away from this. I mean, you need working capital. And, right. um, you know, um, the other thing you talked about management, if you managed by taking attendance, you were in real trouble. <laughs> You know, because nobody showed up anymore. Now what do I do? You know, uh, you have to trust people. That's a cultural issue, which I think a lot of people have actually struggled with over the last couple of years. And we're still coming out of this going, hey, you know, and I don't, don't, maybe I don't trust my people. So, um, you know, but then geography, I think, is another lesson that we've learned. You've been talking about niches and riches. Uh, My view is that what this did was it just freed everybody up from geography. It meant you could operate anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and if that's the truth, well, then you can niche more deeply, right? Yeah. Because um, you, you can have a niche that's super, super narrow, uh, but with a big, broad geography. So yeah. what that means to me is, and this is where I want to take us next, is, okay, in the next few years, if you believe that, if you believe that, now I do, but um, if you believe it, well, okay, that means that your growth path going forward isn't limited to, I forgot the town you mentioned in Ohio. I mean, but you know, you're not limited to just that town. The whole United States, at least same uh, legal geography is, is your oyster. So what are the things that agents need to be doing as they move out in 2022 yeah. 22 appears by all, uh, you know, accounts to be an incredible growth period in our economy. So uh, with lessons learned from COVID, what do agents need to do uh, besides mining the tech stack over the next yeah. 18 to 36 months to start killing it and preparing for the bigger future? Well, I, this is a great question and a great discussion point. I think the first thing, and, and it really boils down to this, is you need to know what your own strategy is for marketing. And so I think it's very easy from the agency owner side to see what other agency owners are doing and, and try to just copy tactics. But what works for somebody tactically in one part of the world isn't going to work for you. And you don't know all the variables that they have in place. And so you really need to define what your strategy is. And that really boils down to who are you trying to do business with? Identifying who your target market is and who the customer is. And you have to identify those people. You have to understand them deeply and you have to know how to reach them. And so I think the easy thing for agents to do is just go, well, I'm going to go do a bunch of Google ads. I'm going to go write some blogs. I'm going to go do events. I'm going to go do, and those might be all well and good, but you also might be finding that you're going to burn a lot of time and money, wasting your time and money on things that shouldn't tactically be in your strategy. And so you have to, everything boils down to what is the strategy? Strategy first, right? And even more than that, above that is what, what, this is how I break things down. What are the goals? Okay, we need to write or we need to do X. We need, we need, we need X. I need to write, uh, I need to start getting more plumbers on the books, right? I need to get more contractors. I need to get more people in X cat in X uh, niche. So that's the goal, right? Then you figure out, okay, well, what's the strategy to get to those people? Because just because a strategy worked for so-and-so in that field doesn't mean it's going to work here. So I need to figure out what the strategy is and then the tactics that go underneath that strategy. So for some people, it's content production and content is anything, whether it's podcasts locally or, you know, geographically centered, whether it is written articles, whether they are ads, whether they are promos, whether they're sales letters, whether they're email campaigns, you know, there's a lot that you can do 
from a tactic standpoint on the marketing, as long as it fits within the strategy of what you're trying to accomplish, that's going to help you reach the goal. So goals, strategy, tactics, that's how those things should be thought out. And then, you know, you have to identify them. So, you know, for, for me, if I was trying to get uh, more high net worth clients and I wanted to get out of kind of the commoditized um, personal line space, and I wanted to start focusing on high net worth individuals, you know, what I do there is going to be different than in other categories. I might create more awareness type articles and, and value pieces that are really meant to educate and provide value to those clients and really showing what the differentiation is between a policy with X carrier versus their standard market carrier that they have, you know, uh, it's creating specific, uh, 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 um, you know, brand interruption or, uh, uh, disruptive type marketing tactics to get in front of those people, knowing I can leverage platforms to disrupt those people with the message. So tactics are the last thing that you should think about. Really what you should be thinking about is what's the goal and what's the overall strategy, whether it's content, whether it's paid action, whether it is uh, in person, whether, you know, there's all kinds of different things that you can do strategically. And it doesn't just have to be one or the other. It could be multiple things. And I think that's what you should be doing. I do agree with you that territories are open now. People who were apprehensive about doing business three states away in 2019, I don't think they're that apprehensive anymore right. or as apprehensive. The reliance for the, the agency on the corner that I can walk into, I can shake their hands and I can have a, an hour long conversation. While it's nice, I don't think is what by and large, the majority of the country is looking for. I think it still works in certain situations. Don't get me wrong. But I think that we have opened up the floodgates and we can now strategically enter in new markets and new places that we're going from a marketing standpoint. You know, I think they'll be interesting to see. There'll be a lot of agencies who figure this out and they're going to grow a lot. And then uh, one of the one of the other things that's going to happen, though, and it's already happening, right? You know, you see these statistics reading the newspaper, magazines, I don't care, uh, television. Everyone's talking about the fact that retirements are at an unprecedented level. Um, people who thought they would work another five or 10 years are saying, you know what, I'm out. Um, and that, that's happening in every state and in every industry. We were challenged before COVID in the independent agency industry with uh, facing a, a big exodus, right? There was uh, something like 70% of the people employed in the business, which includes agency owners, producers, CSRs, and everybody else, age eligible for retirement over the next five years. So we um, aren't, aren't really seeing that yet, but I think we will. I mean, I think uh, as people come back to the office and, and go, gosh, it was more fun at home in my shorts or whatever the case is, we're going to see more of that, which means for people who are not leaving more opportunity, right? Um, and uh, some people be prepared for that. So if you think about that, you think about the fact that, okay, there's a lot of, um, uh, turmoil um, in the business, and you think about Baron Rothschild's comment from the 19th century: "Buy when there's blood in the streets." And in other words, when there's when there's turmoil, when people are getting killed or whatever, there's opportunity. Sure. Um, you know, tech stack strategy tactics. Um, is there is there something else that agencies that really want to grow in this period of time need to think about? I mean, is it acquisition? Is it uh, converting people from other industries to insurance? What are you seeing um, in your work and in, in your association work um, that makes sense to you for people who are really ambitious, aggressive, uh, want to move quickly? Well, I think you know you because you mentioned it, acquisitions. I, I don't know that I I think acquisitions are good for the seller, <laughs> not good for the buyer right now. I think money is very, uh, very cheap and that's good. Um, but you're going to, I think it's a more of a frothy market. Uh, you can tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think it's more of a frothy market. So you're probably going to pay a little bit more. Agencies uh, are transacting for 15 X EBITDA and five X, uh, on revenue, uh, which is probably not sustainable for the average local independent agency. I mean, I think you've got to have a data play or something else to make those numbers work. Yeah. Yeah, so I think from a from a, a growth standpoint, what do agency owners need to do? Um, I think where you can consolidate, I think it's good. I think to your point, there's uh, we are and we've been seeing it for a number of years. It's not like it's it's run up on us, but you know we have uh, an industry force that is 
av- on average is a little bit older. And so they may be looking for an exit <clears> plan, <throat> knowing that money is uh, a little easier to get right now. And so I think that if you want to consolidate or merge, I think that's not a bad strategy as long as it's, you know, it's like picking a spouse, you know, pick the right one. Um, and I think that that's another great way uh, to think about it. I think one of the things I just to interject here, you know, I was just thinking this, one of the things I don't see anybody doing um, that looks like you is employing people who look like me to work when I want to. Um, and almost everybody that I talk to that looks like me, nobody wants to really quit. They just want to get rid of the pain in the ass piece of the, of the sure. work, right? Sure. Um, and, but they don't want to learn how to automate it themselves. They want somebody like you to tell them how to do it. Yeah. Um, do but, you know, yeah. but, you know, I was having lunch with a friend today who's been talking about retirement for the last few years and, He's a, he's in the construction business, right? And the future for construction is really, really up in the air with pricing and everything else. Um, and so he's thinking about bugging out. And yet, you know, what's he going to do with himself? So it seems to me that there's an opportunity. Uh, and COVID has taught us what the opportunity is, frankly, with communications changing, to, to not let this huge number of talented, experienced people leave the workforce and actually grow the business that way. I don't know if you've thought about that. No, I, I, I think to your earlier point, I think it creates a lot of opportunity for people who are trying to grow their staff or their agencies. Um, I think that there are, and this is where you find these kind of unique opportunities. So to your point, you you, you can find somebody who's who's well tenured in the industry. You know, don't they don't require a lot of training and they're productive in whatever role they're, they, they're in. And you can tailor a position for them. I think that the agency owners that get maybe a little more creative or think about their agency culture or management style uh, a little bit differently and a little less rigid or dogmatic, I think will be able to pick some of those people up. Um, I, I think that um, I think we're going to see more people leaving the industry than we will joining the industry. But I think it's going to be somewhat of a pendulum for a little while. Um, I just think you're going to, it's, it's, there's a vacuum that's being created and we have to fill it and we have to get smart about it, whether it's in, in the industry or outside the industry. Yeah. So what's the number one thing that um, is that we're not really prepared for, um, for the next four or five years in the business? What would you say that is? If you said there's one thing and, and boy, this industry is really woefully unprepared for it. What, what would you say that? Oh man, I, do I only get to pick one? Um, well, the top one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it goes back to everybody is so accustomed to doing things a certain way outside of the industry uh, in their normal lives that the insurance industry by and large is so far behind. And I think that that's where we're, we're very, you know, for such a massive industry, profitable industry, competitive industry, an industry that, is cost a lot of money to advertise in the most uh, because there's a demand there. I think that we're very woefully behind when it comes to that. And there's too many failure points amongst things. You know, as an agent, I have to rely on my tech stack, but I also have to rely on my carriers. My carriers don't want to play with my tech stack and my carriers don't want to play with anybody. So I think that's where we're, we're really, we're being underserved is, is by a lot of times our carrier partners. Okay. And what can we do about that? Well, that's an interesting question. So I talk to agents and they'll, and here's the scenario. They'll say, so-and-so carrier just cut our commissions again, and we're really upset about it. And my response is, stop writing with that carrier. Right. Don't write with them. Get, in fact, take it a step further. And why don't you and everybody else get their books of business out of them, out of that carrier? And it's not until agents make that decision to, to, to exercise the power that they wield that they're, they're going to keep getting what they got. And I think that that's what agents need to do. I don't, you know, I have to be careful and I, I don't want to say like, okay, everybody, let's raise the flag and the banner and let's go boycott XYZ carrier. I, I don't want to do that for a number of reasons. Um, but I do think it's, uh, it's an important mindset that as a business owner, you have the power, you have the control. If you don't like the way that someone's doing that, then that, you know, the language that they speak is with, is, is, is money. Right. And so you have the power as an agency force to infect change. If you'll stick to your guns, if you'll stick to your principles and you'll be serious about it. Problem is, is a lot of agents, 
they don't want to do that. They, if, if, if they can take 8% versus not getting anything, they'll do it because it's, and it's a mindset problem really than anything. So agents need to stand their ground. They need to, uh, they need to tell the carriers in force what they want. It's a really good point. And uh, what underlies that, um, it seems to me, is that you're doing a really good job of managing your business. You really understand your book of business. You understand your cost structures. Uh, you know, um, if a carrier cuts um, your commission, let's say, from 10% to 8%, you know, they didn't cut you 2%, it's 20%. And most agencies don't make 20% to the bottom line. So to accept that is to is to go ahead and accept that you're going to be losing money from here on yeah. out. So you have to be running your business, managing your business, really scrutinizing your P&Ls and understanding your cost structures in order to understand what's actually happening to you. And so, yeah, yeah one of the one of my pet uh, things, I guess, is that uh, particularly smaller agency owners, um, you know, would benefit by learning, uh, devoting time to really managing their business, uh, moving from, you know, from salespeople to, to really business uh, managers. And that's hard to do, right? I mean, that's not your background. Most of us right. got in this business owned agencies because we're good salespeople. Yep. Um, you know, and so learning how to manage that business, it takes work and effort. Um, but if you don't do it in the future, as other people accelerate using lower cost uh, technologies like better, um, you're going to be at a big disadvantage and you may not know it until it's too late to do anything about it. Yep. No, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. So, all right. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm just curious if there's anything that um, I didn't ask you that you'd like to talk about, about the future of the distribution business. Um, I think we covered it. I think, I mean, that, that we can have a conversation for the next four hours and I don't think anybody wants that on distribution and what the future of the industry holds and what we think and where things are going. Um, I, I'll say this. I, I remain very optimistic about our channel. I remain optimistic about uh, and knowing and believing that there's going to be agents that are going to continue to push the edge, continue to champion different things and, 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 and push the, the industry forward. And, and I, 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 I think that we're in good hands. I, you know, there's a, we talked a little bit about, uh, maybe a, a demographic that's starting to age out of the industry. I do think that there's uh, a number of younger people coming in and, and I think that it's going to be in good hands. So I would say fear not. Well, you know, I love your optimism and uh, I'm right there with you hundred percent. And uh, you know, back to acquisitions and whether or not you want to be a buyer or seller, you know, you can pick your poison there, but one thing you have to admit is that these businesses that people are building are worth an enormous amount of money, at sure. least in historical norms. Uh, and that's likely to continue for a while because even though interest rates are going to climb undoubtedly over the next couple of years, they're not going to go so high that it really impacts valuations very much. Yep. So, you know, if 30 years ago, you know, an agency well run was worth, you know, one and a half to two times revenue. Now they're worth a lot more. And one of the things that really demands though is, that you invest in that business and pay closer attention to it because the stakes are a lot higher. Um, and so that's worth, I think, thinking about and remembering as you're making investments in your tech stack or whatever. So yeah. um, anyway, good points. Well, hey, it's been a fun conversation. Thanks so much for joining me. And, uh, you know, uh, if you guys want to get a hold of, of Nicholas, um, what's the best way to do it out there? I mean, you gave the, the website address yeah. for for the association, but I mean, you personally. and or, Yeah, and, uh, Be best way, best way, I'll give you two ways. Best way is to connect with me on social. Um, I would say follow me at your own risk, um, but connect with me on social. I'm on all the major platforms. Um, search, search me by name. Other ways, you shoot me an email, nick at betteragency.io. And uh, that's probably the best way to, to get a hold of me. I, I, I'm a firm believer in inbox zero. I can't stand it when I have an unread uh, email. So chances are I'll get to that pretty quickly. Okay, great. Well, I hope folks will reach out to you and best wishes as you keep building better. I'm talking to independent agency owners about this all the time. If you'd like to have a more personalized conversation, click on the button or the link in the description and we'll make that happen. You can also reach out to me at tonycaldwell.net slash contact.